Good evening, everyone. I'll give everyone a few seconds to get logged in and get comfortable. We have an exciting panelist this evening, so um, I can't wait to share this wonderful information about HBCUs. Good evening, everyone. My name is Carolyn Taylor, and I am the Scholarship Coordinator for Milwaukee Public Schools. And this panel discussion is part of our larger Wisconsin Students Go to College campaign, where we take time out of the academic day to make sure that each and every one of our seniors apply to college. This is our first ever HBCU week, and I'm so delighted to help initiate this opportunity for not only students, but staff and the community members to be engaged and understand why HBCU matters. So without further ado, we'll get started. Historically black, black colleges and universities foster student success by meeting the needs of first generation and low income students. HBCUs outperform predominantly white institutions in retention as well as graduating low income students and first generation students. Our HBCU week is here to celebrate colleges and universities and we are so excited to have um, two wonderful panelists that are gonna share their personal experiences and their professional experiences with the audience today. My first panelist is Angelique Jones Cornelius. She is the Director of School Counseling at Go to My Year High School in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. She is a native Milwaukeean. She's a product of the 220 program. If you're not familiar with the 220 program, it is a program that's sponsored by Wisconsin's Department of Public Instruction that help integrate suburban schools. And they would bus African-American students as well as other students out to the suburbs so that they could attend that high school. She holds a max, excuse me, she holds a BA in business from Jackson State. She has a master's in school counseling from Concordia, as well as a master's in educational leadership from Cardinal Stritch. She is a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She is a chartered member of the National Coalition of Negro Women in Milwaukee, also a member of ASCA, WISCA, and the founder of Adopt a High School Senior in Milwaukee. My other distinguished panelist is the Ms. Cheryl Crosby. She also is a Milwaukee native, a graduate of, high, of Washington High School here in Milwaukee. And she participated in the 220 program as she um, went to both elementary, middle, and part of her high school experience in the suburbs. She is a graduate of Alcorn. She has a BA in education and a master's in educational psychology, also from Elkhorn. She is a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. She's a member of the Milwaukee Urban League Guild. Also her professional organizations are ASCA, WISCA, and she is a, on the advisory board of Lakeland College. She sits on the mental health and community health board, and she's also an adjunct, adjunct professor. So we will start first with Ms. Cheryl Crosby. Why did you choose to attend an HBCU? Would you choose to attend if you had to do it over again? <laughs> I think you can tell from my smile, the answer to the second part of that question. Um, yes, I am a proud graduate of Alcorn State University located in Lorman, Mississippi. Um, and I'm gonna be honest, I personally did not choose Alcorn. Alcorn was chosen for me as I come from a line of Alcornites, which we like to refer to ourselves as. Um, my parents um, attended Alcorn State University. Um, my uncle and aunt attended Alcorn State University. Um, other families attended. So when it was time for me to go to college, I had all of these places in mind and my father you know, just basically sat me down and was like, you're going to Alcorn. Um, that's who he entrusted or who uh, 
um, his family entrusted with his education and he knew all along that that was the school that I would be attending once I graduated. And then um, my daughter, um, my only child also is a graduate now of all Corn State University. So we're just a line of all Kernites. Um, if I had to do it all over again, I would absolutely have it no other way. If I could leave tomorrow and start over, um, I would rush out of here and throw some things in the suitcase and get back down there. Um, I, I bleed purple and gold. I love all Corn State University. And um, yeah, if I had an opportunity to do it again, that's exactly, that would be my school of choice. Awesome, thank you. You seem to have a lot of school pride and that is um, exciting to hear. HBCUs, significantly contribute to the creation of African-American degree holders. Over half of all African-American professionals have graduated from HBCUs. Ms. Jones Cornelius, do you feel that Jackson State provided you with a challenging coursework in academics? How did attending an HBCU prepare you for your career and professional goals? So being a graduate um, of Jackson State University, I do feel like it prepared me not only um, for my professional life, but also some strong life skills were gained um, through the process of graduating from um, Jackson State University. So when we talk about rigor, um, I feel like um, it did provide a rigorous um, education for me. Um, being able to um, take those skills and the tools that I've learned um, through classes, um, as well as with networking um, with other students and colleagues, really prepared me to deal with the world. Um, I feel like even today, I graduated well over 20 some years ago, but even today, I'm pulling from those tools um, that I learned at Jackson State and in, in, in helping me to navigate um, not only for myself professionally, but also with working with students um, with that. Um, so I feel well prepared, um, very geared up um, to do whatever I need to do um, professionally and just in life, period. Um, I feel like those were some valuable um, life skills that I learned. Thank you. Historically, Black colleges and universities really foster a sense of success and they really are able traditionally to meet the needs of diverse learners. Um, they outperform, as I said it at the beginning, many white institutions um, in retaining students as well as graduating students. And part of the reason that they've been so successful is the way that they receive students. It's oftentimes an all hands on deck and kids are not numbers in the class, They're, they become family over time. So Ms. Crosby, can you share a little bit about your experience with your professors other college staff, um, any other individuals that were on your campus, how they helped you become welcome, as well as help you meet your uh, professional needs and goals. Sure, so um, I really felt like there was a connection between myself and the faculty at my university. Number one, um, I came from um, Wisconsin, um, like you mentioned before, I was in the chapter 220 program um, for a middle and part of high school. And so I didn't see a lot of uh, teachers in front of me, adults in front of me, helping professionals in front of me that looked like me. And when I got to Alcorn, it was, it was almost like I was, like I was at home, like I had left here and I had gone home. Um, I felt like there was a vested interest in me as a student Oftentimes um, we were treated as if we were an extension of, of our professor's family. I felt that way. Um, even just being in the dorm, living that dorm life, um, we had what we call matrons um, and dorm mothers. And that's exactly the position that they held. They were checking for me. They were making sure that I was where I was supposed to be or uh, making sure that I wasn't in spaces that I shouldn't have been. And I just felt like it was an all hands on approach, um, top down. Um, I felt like I could go to my professors. I felt like they could identify with the cultural, some of the cultural needs that I had. 
Um, and like I said, it was just an extension for my family. And then what was so awesome about that as well is like I mentioned, my parents were students there. So some of the faculty that were there remembered my parents because they went to school there. And so just seeing that last name, they're like, Crosby, where are you from? Where are your people from? And then just sharing that information. And it was like, okay, so you know, I know your mom, you know, you know, I know your dad. So it was just that extension of family. And I just felt like that really helped prepare me. Um, it gave me the motivation that I needed. It gave me the strength that I needed. Um, I felt like it was a village approach. Um, I felt comfortable. I saw people that looked like me. I was able to join in clubs and just see things that I had not been um, you know, exposed to um, in my um, K-12 experience. So it was, it, it, it was an extension of home. It was an extension of family. And like I said, I, I, I believe that my professors had a vested interest in me because when they saw me, they saw them. And I think that's just added to my, um, to my college experience. Wow, that is extremely powerful. Thank you for sharing. Ms. Jones Cornelius, I see you nodding your head. Would you like to add any comments to how you felt received by your professors and other staff at Jackson State? Um, just similar to what um, Cheryl is saying, Ms. Crosby, um, just feeling at home. Um, you just always feel a part of the organization um, just when you're there. So it's more than school. It does feel like family. So when you talk about homecomings and that, it truly is like going back to your family reunion. Um, some people are still there. They remember you. Um, you have people from all over the United States, too. So and just when you've been in class together, now people have families, um, but they they're they're just super proud of you. And like Cheryl was saying, when the professors see you, they see themselves and they take pride in it. So I just felt that, that was a very powerful statement statement to say. So, yes, definitely. Thank you. And that's one of the things that as I've done my research about HBC use and I support students and fans when they're making these huge decisions about what to do after high school mm -hmm. that there are lots of research um, conducted and that's what's coming out of the research is that HBCUs have a very familiar um, experience to are able to um, build relationships that are lasting not only while they're in college but those relationships extend well beyond graduation and that they are part of the African-American cultural norm so when students get on campus their things are familiar um, the way business is conducted is familiar and students don't have um, as much of an adjustment period of course you going away from to, to school, there is an inherent adjustment period, but when you're being received by an HBCU, many students feel right at home. And that really leads me into another question and either Ms. Jones or Ms. Cornelius, either of you wonderful ladies can take um, and approach uh, this question. I'd like for one of you to paint a picture for students and families and even MPS staff about the culture and traditions that make HBCUs stand out from other higher educational institutions. Talk to us about HBCU homecomings, perhaps pageants, school pride, of course, African-American Greek letter organizations. Share with us, paint us the picture. What does that look like? What does it feel like? And how did that help connect you to your institution? Um. I can go first. So I'll just start by saying again, you're going to hear this and I think you're going to hear this um, at any HBCU panel. It's a family. So when you become a part, for me, my experience, and I think Ms. Jones Cornelius echoes this, you become a part of a family. You become engulfed in this culture and it's a culture within a culture. We talk about you know, the African-American culture, but there's like a culture within a culture when you talk about going to a an HBCU. Um, I, I literally just came back from homecoming. Um, so you got to think I graduated a long, long time ago. But when I go back, it's like I've never left. And it is, it's a reunion. And on top of it being a friendship, a family, it's also a sense of pride because you see so many people that have accomplished great things, things that historically were thought that we would not be able to accomplish. You know, I went to school, people that I hung out with, people that you played around with, 
excuse me, they're now doctors and lawyers and educators and business owners, and they've come back. And, um, you know, I mentioned earlier, I sent my daughter, my, my only child to Alcorn State University because I knew, I, I can vouch for that. I knew what I received there. And I had no doubt that she would receive the same top-notch education and also be able to experience that family-like atmosphere. Um, some of my very closest and dearest friends um, I got at all, you know, or I, I, I met at Alcorn. And today, you know, we celebrate each other. We celebrate each other's now extended families and husbands and children. But when you think it's some of what you see on TV, yeah, I know there, there are movies that are out there and you think, oh, that's what college life is, life is like. Some of it is, and some of that you can kind of, you know, just get a, a glimpse of that fun side of it. But that family-like atmosphere and being in a place where people, where you're, you're accepted, you're not trying to fit in. This is your place. You're not trying to fit into a place or navigate through a system where, you know, people don't look like you or, you, you know, you may feel like you have to prove yourself. You have to prove yourself, but you have to prove yourself because these people believe in you and you don't want to let them down and disappoint them. So when I paint that picture, if I could paint a picture, you know, it would be full of life. It would be full of love, fun, laughter, great food. And then for me to have joined um, a sorority, I am um, a member of Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And just to have that sisterhood on top of that family-like atmosphere, um, it was just the icing on the cake. And it just, you just become a part of like an elite society. And it's about sisterhood and it's about, um, um, it's about learning and growing and sharing and giving back. And it, it just gives you a sense of pride. So it's like pride on top of pride on top of pride and just that family-like atmosphere and just the feeling of being at home. Um, I, I just can't emphasize that enough. So that that's my picture of it. You know, there now I don't want it to make I don't want people to think that it was all roses. Oh, you have to work. Um, if there was rigor, there was rigor involved. And like I said, there's an expectation um, of you when you are when you are a student um, at an HBCU, and it is it's like we have to keep things going. You know, we have to keep these traditions going. We have to keep this reputation going. So when you become an HBCU student, there is a lot that is expected of you, but with the right support, the right tools, just that, just being in a place where you can feel comfortable and you have people that are rooting for you, that look like you, that embrace you, then you can only be successful. And the data shows you that you all will find out about that later on. Absolutely. Well, I thank you for that, those words. Ms. Jones Cornelius, would you like to help us paint a picture of students and family? Well, I think Cheryl painted the perfect picture, <laughs> but just like she's saying, um, just a sense of family um, that you just feel always, even when you go back. Um, Jackson State Homecoming is happening this weekend. I won't be there, <laughs> but just still being connected to the university, I know that. I have students now on campus. They're excited about it. Um, just that feeling and like she's saying, being connected to people, you're connected for life. Like, um, you know, you really do know a judge, a lawyer, a doctor, educators from people, you know, throughout the United States um, that you just kind of have those connections. So when you say that you are a certain graduate from a school, everybody would jump in. Hey, you know, I graduate from here or there. And we also have our inside HBCU stuff that we do. So Cheryl is from my rival school. Alcorn and Jackson State are rivals, but I do have family that graduated from Alcorn and I'm sure her brother, her younger brother went to Jackson State when I was at Jackson State. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a fun thing that we kind of do, but we always support each other whenever um, we're in need of something. Like Cheryl as well, I um, um, pledged Jack, um, Delta Sigma Theta at Jackson State as well. So then you're part of another family um, that you continue to have lifelong um, friendships with as well. So again, um, when you just paint that picture, like she's saying, life, love, um, happy times. Also, there's something called an HBCU grind. Like some things we don't have that easily come to us. We don't have a lot of resources for certain things, but we learn how to get what we need to get to where we need to go to. So just know that too. So I always say people that graduate from HBCUs, they move different. 
because they know what it's what it's going to take to get ahead. So again, I just feel like all of that um, should create the picture for um, being an HBCU grad. Excellent. So Angelie, because you are a practicing, practicing school counselor, and I know that you have had many opportunities to take students on campus, can you give the audience just a couple of nuggets on how students from Milwaukee public schools and other um, places in Milwaukee have experienced the HBC tours. So any um, ahas that kids came away with, any current students that are HBCUs that you can share a little bit about their experience. So pretty much at every high school that I've been at, that I worked at, Washington High School of IT, Bayview, Golda, um, they've all taken their students on HBCU college tours. They're known for it. So when you um, take students um, from high school that have an interest and you expose them um, to HBCU being an option for them, when they go on campus, they're just taking in like how welcoming it is for one. And then all the, the student life and the, the, um, the teachers, the professors, how at home they just feel automatically um, there's nothing for a student to come up and talk to them, have conversations with them. Um, I think it means more when it's a student from Milwaukee. So usually if we're on campus, I will ask um, if there are students that you know are not in class or available to come out and speak to the students. So then they're seeing someone um, that's not only at an HBCU, but they're also from Milwaukee. So they're like, man, this can really happen. So then it starts with the connections and not only just listening to your school counselor, but now you made a connection with a student that's there that was probably where you are, that where you are like two years ago. So they're fresh, they're on campus, they're telling them about how it is and what needs to happen. Um, and then they're just giving them nuggets of things that they need to be prepared for. Um, students do get homesick. That happens. The weekends can be lonely sometimes. But like Cheryl is saying, that's where that family comes in at. And sometimes your professors are extended family or your roommate may be from the city that, you know, that you're in. So those are just different things that can happen as well. So, um, you know, once students are on campus, they're talking to students, they're talking about programs that they're interested in, because that's always very important um, to connect them with the different majors and programs that they're interested in. So they're making one-on-one -on -one connections right there with advisors, with admissions reps. So the people, you know, they want them to come to the school. Like we we're talking about, it's just very welcoming. They're trying to figure out how to get them there. So then, you know, we can go on and on into, you know, financial aid and finances and what it's going to take to get prepared. But it's just giving them a time, you know, to walk around on campus and really get that feel for what it's like. So you're just not, you know, watching a TV show or listening to me about it you're actually right there. And some of them are like, oh my gosh. But even like being a part of a sorority, when I walk on campus, if I have my letters on, they'll see, you know, my sorors come up to me. They were like, but you don't even know them. We're part of the same organization. We know each other. You know, we, you know, we greet, we don't meet. So we talk about that as well. So again, you know, I let them know, you know, being a, you know, a graduate of Jackson State, if I go on all corn campus, you know, I'm going to mess with them. They already know. <laughs> or if I go on another campus, I'm going to have my Jackson State stuff on, on purpose. So, you know, but it's just the connection um, that, you know, students are able to make just, just easily. It just, it just kind of just happens, you know, quicker than, you know, with some other um, institutions. So like we're saying, you feeling at home, like this, this is who you are, this is where you need to be, come on. So, and you know, some students may have siblings there and then, you know, if it's homecoming time or if it's an activity week, um, students are able to, you know, partake in some other things as well. So again, just exposing them to, you know, college campus tours right now because the pandemic, a lot has had to be virtual, but um, I still try to get reps to come in and talk to the students as, as you know, as much as they can just so they can just really get that feel. But a lot of it comes from um, with students and staff. They see my energy when I talk about Jackson State. Like you said, I do have degrees from other institutions. But when you say Jackson State, something just wake, you know, wake up. So if I say all corn, something just kind of, you know, wake you up. You like, right, like, hey, that's my school. That's my home. So, and that's where it started, you know, being a student from a chapter 220 um, school. I went to Franklin High School, but I went straight from Franklin to a HBCU. So that's just a whole different dynamic and culture. Um, I feel so much a part of Jackson State even now, um, you know, so I didn't want to keep going on and on. But, you know, I can go on and on about this HBCU thing. I love my I, 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 
That is wonderful. Thank you, Ms. Jones. I am so delighted that we have our special guest present. So I do want to properly introduce um, Representative Lakeisha Myers, my server. <laughs> so welcome on the line. Um, we have been discussing a lot of aspects of HBCUs, but I want to give our audience a bit of information about you so that they can understand that you too are prideful in your HBCU. Representative Lakeisha Myers is a native of Milwaukee. She's a proud graduate of Rufus King High School. She holds a BA in political science from Alcorn, as well as a uh, master's from Strayer University and an ED from Agrosa University. She is a member of Alcorn State University National Alumni Association. She's a proud member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. She sits on a number of boards, as well as other organizations that all support students um, and the community at large. And so I'll give her a few minutes to greet everyone and share her HBC experience. Well, good evening, everyone. I was racing from Madison. I said I cannot miss this opportunity because HBCUs are most definitely close to my heart. I went to the greatest HBCU ever created, the Alcorn State University, home in Lorman, Mississippi. So right there where Ms. Cheryl Crosby went, we were on campus, not at the same time, but the legacy surely continues. So I just want to let everybody know that if you can think it and you can dream it, you can surely achieve it at an HBCU. I think when I came in on the tail end of Ms. Jones' comments, she talked about going to that other school down the street from us in Mississippi, <laughs> Jackson State, which is one of our biggest rivals. But when you think about um, having a homegrown experience, that is what my HBCU experience was. I will tell everybody the story that my parents graduated from Alcorn State University. That is where they met and fell in love. Mm -hmm. And I had only been to Alcorn once before, actually twice before I got dropped off on campus. So I was born and raised in Milwaukee, and because we live so far away, we hardly ever got the opportunity to go back to Mississippi to go to football games. Um, but I think we went once when I was about 10, and it was during the summer, so I was able to see this magical place called Alcorn. And I went and walked around campus, and I felt really at home there. And then when I got ready to go to college, um, I had always said I was going to Alcorn. You know, it's cute when you're a kid and you go to Alcorn events as an alumnus. And people always say, where are you going to go to college? I say, I'm going to go to Alcorn. And they used to say, oh, that's so cute. And when it came time for me to get ready to go to college, I had my heart set on going to Howard University. I will tell this story. I got accepted to six HBCUs. I got accepted to five of them. Uh, and Howard was my number one choice because I wanted to run for office one day and I knew that I wanted to be in the seat of power and that is Washington, D.C., and I kept waiting and waiting on Howard. But I also applied to Alcorn because that was my, that's my family school. That's the legacy is, is it was a no brainer that you had to apply to Alcorn. And I happened to get my acceptance letter to Alcorn first. And my mother looked at me, I said, okay, I go to Alcorn. And my mother said, are you sure? She said, you've only been to campus one time. I said, I think I can do it. She said, well, let's take a trip and visit just to make sure you'll be okay. So we took spring break and we went to Alcorn and I fell in love with campus. And it was there, it was a buzz. It was right during lunchtime. I got to see the calf in full action. I got to see some good looking guys when I was on campus. Uh, hey, I was 18, I had to, I, I was looking. And I said, okay, I said, I can, I can, I think I can make it here, I can do this. And think about this. I went from living in the city of Milwaukee where we have access to McDonald's and every other restaurant you can name right up close to you. And I went to a campus that is 1700 acres of wide open space <laughs> in rural Mississippi. And everybody said, you really want to go to school in the country? I had the best time of my life right there. It was the best decision I ever made in my life. And people ask me all the time, are you upset that you didn't go to Howard? Howard actually did accept me just mm -hmm. two weeks after Alcorn did. But I said, nope, I made my decision. And I thank God for that decision today. When I think about the, the numbers, when you look at the uh, student teacher ratio uh, being something like 17 to one or 18 to one in a class with your major, 
Um, when I think about the diversity that was on campus, and that's a real conversation that we think about today. My classmates came from Canada, they came from South Africa, they came from Russia. Um, I, I went to school with the Rainbow Coalition for real, and we were at an HBCU. So it amazes me when I put things in perspective, when I talk to students who are, who are here in the state, and we talk about the issues of diversity within the UW system, and that's a campus of 50,000 people, where you can be sitting in a class of 300 in a lecture hall as a freshman. I knew that experience was not for me. My largest class my freshman year probably was 35 people. That was the size of my high school classes. I would be okay you know, when I, when I was in school. So when you think about being able to look at your schedule and you see Dr. Smith is teaching your English class, Dr. Smith is who showed up that first day and that's who was actually teaching your class. I had direct access to my professors. I didn't have to worry about going to see the TA or somebody else who was teaching the class, a graduate student who was teaching the class uh, to ask questions. I have direct access to my professors then and even now. And we built friendships um, that have lasted beyond my time on campus. I've called some of my professors when, you know, I needed letters of recommendation, when I needed advice, and they are still available to me today. And it is just an extension of, of your, your family like you have at home. I get emails from former professors and they tell me all the time, we're proud of you. We're paying attention to the work that you were doing. You know, you are a part of the Alcorn Network or you're a part of the HBCU Network. And I'll tell you something else, when it came time to doing internships on campus, guess what? Fortune 500 companies come to HBCUs and they recruit. I know a lot of people who work for the federal government, who work for Merck, who work for Pfizer, who work for Miller Bruin uh, or uh, Molson Coors now, because those companies come to HBCUs, even smaller ones like Allpoint, and they get students because they know they are prepared. And for those of you that are thinking, even in the back of your mind, you may be running from it, kind of like I did, and you think you want to be a teacher, most African-American teachers graduate from HBCUs. Most African-American doctors graduate from HBCUs. Most African-American dentists and engineers graduate from HBCUs. So this is the place to be. You have a wide range and network. I will compare my network at my HBCUs to that of Harvard. Because when you know you see Harvard on a resume, you should have a quality candidate. If I see Jackson State, Morris Brown, Clark Atlanta, you know, any school that's an HBCU on a resume, I'm giving that person a second look. And I've had that opportunity to give other folks an opportunity to work in certain spaces that they may not otherwise have. Um, mm -hmm. And because I saw that HBCU listed there. So I want you to think about that when it's time for you to make certain decisions that you have. Um, so th that was my HBCU experience. I I'll say it again. It was the best decision I made in my life. Uh, I think I've made three good decisions that I could say can't change the trajectory of my life. The first one was graduating from the best school anywhere, Rufus King High School. The second, going to Alcorn State University. And the third, pledging Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority. So I tell you, those were three good decisions that I can say have changed my life. Absolutely excellent. So can you talk to us, Representative, a little bit about your work in bringing HBCU representatives to the Milwaukee area? And so what was your vision to have uh, and host HBCU fairs? So the HBCU college fair that we unfortunately won't have this year, nor last year because of the pandemic, um, that was kind of the brainchild between myself and Senator Lena Taylor. And if anybody knows Senator Taylor, she didn't graduate from an HBCU, but she understands agriculture. And she was on the agriculture committee and she learned about something called the 1890 scholarship. And the 1890 scholarship is, uh, is, is a scholarship that provides uh, full tuition, room and board, as well as books and paid internships in the summer for students. And she said, this is only for HBCUs. And I said, mm -hmm, I've heard of it. And she said, well, why didn't I know about this? What, why are we leaving money on the table? She, I said, because when most people think about agriculture, they think about old McDonald had a farm. And that's the extent of where our agricultural background, uh, especially for city kids, goes. You're like, I won't be no farmer. 
I'm not going outside. I don't want to, you know, deal with trees and other kind of stuff. But she has slowly but surely changed the trajectory and made sure that agriculture and the agribusiness atmosphere has been uh, highlighted, especially in the city of Milwaukee, to expand the knowledge of our students to understand that arbor, uh, forestry, that becoming a horticulturist and arborist um, are our jobs that we cannot fill in this state because we have to recruit people from out of state to do those jobs. Um, she always talks about understanding the cycle of food. It starts way before you get to the grocery store, but there's a, an agricultural economist that, that is able to regulate the price of bacon and milk that you have in the store. That's somebody's job. That's a job that we can't fill because we don't have enough people to, to study agriculture. So it is way more and way more intricate than just being the person that sows the seeds in the ground and wants to cultivate crops. It starts there, but there is an entire um, you know, ecosystem that exists around agriculture. And she also learned about the 1993 um, uh, scholarship, which was given directly to students who attend tribal colleges and universities. Mm -hmm. So we can't forget our tribal colleges. And in Wisconsin, we have two tribal colleges that exist in the state of mm -hmm. Wisconsin. I believe both of them, um, if not one of them for sure, is a two-year university. And that 1993 scholarship exists there. So she wanted to make sure that students of color in the Milwaukee area and in, in our metro area are not leaving scholarship money on the table. I always tell people, you can go out and do anything you want to do. You only need one degree to do it. And it doesn't matter if you get that degree in agriculture and then you go teach somewhere, you go do something else. It is valuable to have. So we have to make sure that we do things that work for our benefit. Mm -hmm. Everybody always talks about sports and making sure that we focus on sports. There are other ways to go to college for free. And agriculture might just be the way for you to do that. There, like I said, there's agricultural economics. That's an accounting degree. You can become a forester. That means you like to work with trees. Um, you can be an agronomist. So you're working with soil science. There's animal husbandry. If you want to become a veterinarian, you can get that ag scholarship to go to veterinary school to get your undergraduate degree in veterinary science because all of that fits together. When you think about our pro start programs or the culinary arts academies that we have in MPS, a lot of those students at Vincent High School and at Washington and at Madison are applying now for those scholarships because they had their foundation in those academies and they're able to translate that into what used to be called home economics, but now it's hotel restaurant management. So mm -hmm. it's, it's more economics of running an operation and a business. So they can get scholarships as well. So we cannot no longer afford to leave valuable scholarship dollars on the table. The other part of that is having um, compacts with other universities. How many of us know that we have uh, a land grant institution, uh, a college in, in Wisconsin? The University of Wisconsin-Madison is a land-grant school. It is what's considered an 1830 land-grant institution. So an 1830 land-grant institution means that you can't take away the agricultural basis from UW. That means that that's why they produce ice cream on campus. That's why they do soil science research on campus. That's why they have cows out in pastures in, in Dane County and students go out there and take care of them. All of those same things existed on the campus that I went to as well. So when you think about those traditional relationships, these are graduate school feeders that come directly from HBCUs. So I would suggest that anybody um, that is interested remotely in any of the sciences, look at what the USDA has to offer. There are summer programs that exist called Ag Discovery for uh, students as low as sixth grade um, up through 12th grade. Those are free on-campus residential programs that they have at, I believe, 18 HBCUs. The closest one to us would be Central State University that offers that program. Um, and if you look at those programs, they also have, uh, through the USDA Forest Service, there's the um, conservation, Youth Conservation Corps, and they will fly you out to, I believe it's California or Oregon for the summer, and you work. Um, learning about wildfires, learning about, you know, different types of uh, um, 
weather related instances for um, everything outside. That's all I say, you major in outside when you do that. So with the forest, you learn about uh, trees, all of the environmental aspects of what we're dealing with now. All of these are relevant conversations and they come with dollars attached to them that can help you make it through college. So parents, if you're listening, grandparents, this is valuable information that you can utilize for your student. If they won't fill out the scholarship application, you fill it out for them, okay? Sometimes we gotta help those that will not help themselves. So I think that's something that we have to do when you, you're looking out for the best interests of our children and understanding that there are different ways that we can um, become flexible and malleable in what our children want to do and the scholarships that are available for them. There's a lot of money millions that is left on the table every year. And I want to point out that this, these scholarships are not only designated for African-American students. I've had Hispanic students take part in them, Asian students. You just have to attend an HBCU. HBCUs are multicultural institutions. They are open to all students of all ethnicity. So if you are a white student and you want to attend an HBCU, we welcome you. If you are a student who is Hispanic, Latino, uh, Asian, you know, any of the BIPOC communities, we invite you to come to HBCUs and explore them and see what can be offered to you. Absolutely. I think that all of the information that you provided is completely on point. I want to point out that we also have the United Negro College Fund um, tour that's coming to coming locally to a computer near you, which will take place both Friday, October 15th and October 16th. And that's where students grade nine through 12 can um, have workshops on financial aid, understanding how to apply to scholarships and how to also work with um, their school counselor and other college access individuals to help them complete applications. And so I really would encourage every single high school student from Milwaukee across the country to attend United Negro College Fund virtual tours. And it's free to join. Um, high school seniors will have the opportunity to meet with admission counselors. You can discuss your transcript, um, what it would be like to be on that particular HBCU, and you could walk away with not only admissions, but also a scholarship to help pay down the cost of your tuition. And so um, I highly encourage that. So thank you for all of those good suggestions. Um, I want to take two more questions. And then we're going to wrap up our discussion for this evening. I want to talk to anyone that wants to share information about if a student is interested in applying to an HBCU, what are some tricks, some tips, some tools, some college um, application portals that could help them on their journey? Would anyone like, would Ms. Cheryl, Ms. Crosby, would you like to share a little bit about um, how to apply to college? Ms. Jones Cornelius, what have some of your students used? to apply to HBCUs? So right now we're currently in our college application month. So one application that I have our students use is the Common Black College application. Students are able to apply up to 55 or more colleges for a small fee of just $20. So there's one application um, when they fill it out, um, it instantly goes to all of the colleges. So then the students, they just need a transcript uploaded from their school counselor and their ACT scores. Um, there's a quick turnaround. Students were very surprised that those institutions get their information. And I have some students even now getting acceptance letters um, just instantly based on their merits and you know just applying simply uh, through the Common Black app. I also have students go to the different websites and research the college out making sure that the college, you know, they have your major, they have things you're interested in. Um, if you're looking at location, um, you know, do I have family in the state or, or not, or just, you know, exploring um, the different colleges as, as well kind of helps. Also, once students are accepted, here's another piece that happens. Then the college will open up their merit scholarships to you that are not necessarily on the website. So now you're accepted here. Now you can see um, just different other opportunities that are available to you as a student um, that students can apply to. Another thing to have students look at is out-of-state tuition. So um, a few years ago, Jackson State got rid of their out-of-state tuition. So before it was like 10,000, 11,000 to go out-of-state to Jackson State. Now per 
semester, it's only like $500. Mm -hmm. So then that puts them on even playing ground field with some of the local colleges. It's the same cost because a lot of, you know, people say, oh, I can't go out of town. It costs too much or this isn't. It. Now it's the same cost. So if it's a good fit for you, be open to the fit. And, you know, if it's the major that you're interested in and they have that, now you have another option on the table because a lot of times I'm finding that HBCU is not um, um, providing information for students when they're applying to colleges. So at Golda, any school that I'm at, the HBCU is always gonna be an option. So I do make that readily available to students and parents. And we can kind of walk one-on-one -on -one through that, through the cost, what it's offering, um, those scholarships that they're talking about. We, we take a deep dive into all of that because sometimes students don't know what they don't know and parents don't know what they don't know. But it's for us to, you know, provide that information and not leave it out. So, you know, we do have to, you know, be open to and have open minds about when it comes to an HBCU and what, you know, what's offered with an HBCU. So just have an open mind because again, at Golda, 11% of our graduating classes attend HBCUs. So our first graduating class actually they're all seniors in college. So we're anxiously awaiting for all of those graduations. Um, Morehouse, Howard, Jackson State, Alcorn, just, we're just waiting for this, um, for the students. And they're you know, extremely excited about it, that they were given that opportunity to attend an HBCU and then also to come and give back um, to the students here um, in Milwaukee and to go on and do great things. So those are just some of my tips that I just use with students. Okay, excellent. I also would like to point out that the Common App also has HBCU. So if students are interested in applying to Howard University, um, Spelman Hampton, I believe that there are 12 HBCUs that are on the Common App. And what's important about that piece is that if students qualify for free or reduced lunch, they can get a fee waiver. So they can apply to these top universities without having to pay the $75 application fee or $50 application fee. So it's a great way and a great tool to use. So we have the HBCU Common App as well as the Common App as tools for admissions. And of course, if students attend the United Negro College Fund, there are no fees at all attached to meeting with an advisor or an admissions counselor. So students could walk away knowing exactly where they're gonna go on Saturday, which is exciting to me, especially for parents, because then you can start planning and you can start thinking more about the finances and how do you finance your college education. So would anyone like to give some additional um, tips? Yes. Did you have your hand raised? Representative, please. <laughs> Yes. I did. I just yes. wanted to say, once you get accepted to your preferred HBCU, reach out to that HBCU's Alumni Association, whether nationally or locally, especially if they have a local alumni association. Um, there are scholarship dollars that usually res reside with those organizations because that's one of the things that they do is actually give scholarships to students who are attending from their local area. I know that to be true from Jackson State, and I know that to be true for Alcorn, as well as several others, that once you get accepted at that particular um, university, they will give you um, a scholar their scholarships that are available. And for those, if you need additional information, there's an organization here in Milwaukee called HBCU Alumni United. And if you contact my office, I can give you the list of schools that are members of that organization where there are scholarships available. Each of those uh, colleges, the, the alumni associations locally give scholarships to their respective sco schools. That is excellent information and I'll be sure to post it on the scholarship database that I maintain for Milwaukee Public School as well as it is for facing. So if other um, students that are on the call would like to access that information, it will be available shortly to you. I would also like to add that there are scholarships, other local institutions that support HBCUs. I know that St. Mark's Church, they have scholarships specifically mm -hmm. earmarked for HBCUs. I know that many of the sorority and fraternities also support students um, as they journey on to HBCU. So there's lots of resources because um, members of the community recognize that HBCUs could potentially be underfunded and that many of the students may need additional support and help so that they can um, attend those universities as well as graduate and hopefully graduate with as less as possible.
So let's talk a little bit more about financial aid and then we're gonna check the chat to see if there are any questions from the audience that we can try to answer for them. So financing your college education. So any tips or tricks um, that parents and students should know. So we talked about scholarships. I know that there's one big um, push right now going on. Would anyone like to cover FAFSA? So completing the FAFSA. So the um, financial aid application is open and open October 1st. It perhaps is the most important step in applying for, uh, or ensuring that you're gonna have enough money to go to college. And so completing the FAFSA will qualify you for low cost, low interest loans, as well as um, determine your eligibility in grants. For example, the Pell Grant, which could be upward of $6,000 for students and families that qualify as well as many universities require that document to be completed in order to qualify for their institutional dollars. So the FAFSA is an essential part of your college application process. And so if you need help, there's always a willing partner in your school building. You have your licensed school counselor as well as college and career advisors that are housed in each and every Milwaukee public um, school, high school, so that you know that there are people that can help you. They, they are trained to support your post-secondary options. So I'm going to give the panelists a few, maybe one to two minutes to close us out to share either a wonderful experience or some words of encouragement to parents and students about HBCU. How we start with Ms. Cheryl Crosby. Um, just to close out, I would just say, go apply and apply early. Um, you know, as Representative Myers said earlier, she applied to six universities, and um, but she did end up at the best university, I will say that. But apply and apply early. Um, just take in some of the information that you received here tonight, especially, um, I know that you all can see that this was not rehearsed. Every single one of us mentioned that family-like atmosphere, for the parents who are listening also, um, when you talk about entrusting your child, especially we know that when we talk about HBCUs, we know that your child is gonna be a good distance away, but just know that I think all of us have shared that experience about that family-like atmosphere. So it's an, it's an extension of home, it's an extension of you, which I feel is just so important. So I would just say, you know, just apply, do your research. Um, find out about the, the data that's out there around uh, minority students and their outcomes when they attend um, historically Black colleges and universities, the graduation rates, um, retention rates. Um, and then now that the, that the playing field has been even, so to speak, as um, Ms. Jones Cornelius spoke of, with those out-of-state fees being waived. And I did want to mention, I wanted to jump in earlier, but do your research. A lot of HBCUs, especially for those high GPA students, if you are a number one or number two student, or if you are your class valedictorian or salutatorian, there are automatic scholarships. I know for one, for all corn, so I'll, I'll stick with all corn. If you are a number one or number two student, student, you have an automatic full ride scholarship. So keep that in mind. Um, you want to go to school and you want to come out with um, the least amount of student loans possible. So just keep that in mind and apply and apply early. HBCUs do fill up, um, um, especially when we talk about dorm life. Um, so if that's something that you are interested in, I would say start looking now. Um, if you don't have family members who have previously attended HBCUs, look to your church. You're going to find many churches um, that have HBCU um, alumni there. Um, you got your state representatives here. Look in your schools. Talk to your teachers. Talk to your school counselors. Get connected. Um, anyone out there who's interested in Alcorn State University and you have questions, you can always contact me. Um, um, as uh, Ms. Taylor stated, I'm the academic and career planning coordinator. And I would love, as you can see, we love our HBCU. I would love, I could talk to you about HBCUs. Um, all day and all night. So please feel free to contact me, but I wish everyone, um, everyone good luck. And um, I hope that um, we have some people or some, some of the students on here and families on here that will attend HBCUs and then we'll be reaching out to you so that you can share your experiences as well. Thank you, Ms. Crosby. 
how about Ms. Jones Cornelius? Some final thoughts? Well, some of my final thoughts will be your journey is your journey. And just remember that because sometimes there are a lot of naysayers when it comes to your journey, um, when you're doing your research, because you have to realize that it's going to be you sitting in that class, you attending that school, not the person that's trying to either talk you out of not going or some other things. So um, also, like Ms. Crosby is saying, apply early. Um, none of these um, acceptance letters are binding. As you know, people are accepting the six, five, 10 colleges, whatever, you make the decision in the end. And usually it is a financial decision. So again, when you're applying early and you're getting accepted, look at the cost of attendance. What does it cost for me to attend this school? And then once I do my FAFSA, I you know, subtract that from there and then go after scholarships. Um, if you're top of your class, there are, when we talked about merit scholarships based on your academics, there are merit scholarships and the same as Alcorn, Jackson State, you're top of your class, you're in there. Um, most schools, it is like a, a sliding scale. When it comes to your GPA ACT score, I know there's certain money available to you at Howard, Jackson State, Alcorn, that they have readily available for you, whether you're an in-state or out-of-state student, it doesn't matter. The money is there based on your, um, your academics and your ACT scores. So just remember that. Um, and like we're saying, just do your research um, because you're making a life decision. You are when you make this decision to attend this um, institution. So just know that. But again, um, anybody that wants to go to Jackson, any HBCU, any, just you can call me. <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. Um, I will talk to you um, and kind of walk you through some things as a school counselor and what does that take? So I'm open to that and having those discussions and my um, suggestion to parents, have those real conversations with your kids about your finances. Because a lot of times um, your, your child, they don't really understand finances until it's college time. I myself being a mother of four, I do have two um, daughters that are juniors. They're already looking at HBCU, so they already know um, just being open to that and the cost of it, because I will, you know, I have four daughters, but they all will be in college together at one time because that's how close they are in age. So just having those open conversations about finances and just exploring colleges and making sure it's a good fit. So my takeaway to you is your journey is your journey and just focus on that and what's best for you and your family. Um, but just be open to the HBCUs. Thank you. Please, final comments, Representative Myers. My final comments echo exactly what Ms. Crosby and Ms. Jones Cornelius just said. You, you have to make the decision for yourself and to choose which school is actually the best fit for you. Um, and, and hopefully that will be an HBCU. We have about 100 that are still in operation, pick one. We will help you get there, okay? We will help you figure out what it is to get you to that particular HBCU. Uh, have the conversations with your children. Parents, if you're listening, you have to have that real, you know, as they used to say, come to Jesus moment. You need to have that conversation about what your fin family's finances are and what you, you can afford, um, particularly if you're looking at it and you're not getting the, the amount of scholarship dollars that you would hope to get. Um, that said, students, you have to go out and actually do the work and look for those scholarships. There are scholarships in obscure places. Um, you may be an artist, there, they can be $500 scholarships, $250 book scholarships, all of those put together do add up and they can help defray the cost of your education. There should never be, you know, the thought that, oh, that's not enough money because small scholarships pieced together can get you a semester. It can buy you a book, it can buy you three books. And especially if you are a, you wanna be in the uh, biological sciences or anything in the medical field, all of your books are really expensive. So you should be prepared for that and actually think about that process and what it is that you can bring to the table to earn that scholarship. Um, so that would be some of the things I would say. There was a question about what can middle school and you know early middle school and elementary school parents do. You can start preparing now for your child's HBCU future if you have an elementary school student. I would start by, you know if you happen to be in a city, visit an HBCU campus, start having the conversation start you know, looking at, at movies, drumline, whatever it is about an HBCU and get them excited, get them you know, trying to figure out, oh, that's cool, I wanna go to an HBCU. 
it starts from that young age. If you have the opportunity to go to some of the classics that exist um, that are closed. I know Chicago usually has a Chicago football classic. You can go see an HBCU band up close and personal. It will change your life. So, you know, especially for students who have not been exposed to HBCUs in their own family, you can talk to individuals that you know, the four of us that are here, we will, you know, try to guide you in that direction to get you in touch with people who've gone to HBCUs, even if it's not the HBCU that we went to. Um, I think that's where you can start at the elementary school level. I think at the middle school level, you start, and, and I got guidance or professional school counselors on the line with us that will tell you that you need to start thinking about those ACT prep courses in sixth and seventh grade. It's never too early. Your scores are good for five years. If I were a parent, my child would start taking the ACT in sixth grade. I'm just going to be real with you because by the time eighth grade comes, the test is written off 10th grade math. So if you're doing it right, you can actually have that score that is good enough to get you in a school is good for five years. So start getting into the habit of thinking if, if college is going to be your trajectory, start thinking about those things early on and start communicating with your child's counselor about what options and what summer experiences are available to them. We talked about some uh, um, under the banner of the USDA, but there are others. There are um, you know, science and engineering camps that exist for students that at HBCUs, there are you know, agriculture camps, there are dance camps, there are all different types of sports camps that exist, um, you know, week long or weeks long camps that have you in residence on an HBCU campus. So that's something that I say that middle school level parents can start looking at. High school, you know, we want you to start thinking your freshman year about the end. Your destination should be graduation, your first day of ninth grade. So thinking about that and how you're going to prepare yourself, you know, all throughout your four years in high school about where you're going to set yourself up to be at the end of that time. Um, understanding how to read your transcript, understanding that you need to look at your transcript. Um, you know, it's too late when you go see your counselor at 12th grade and say, oh, I didn't realize my GPA was X, Y, Z. Well, you need to start having those conversations yearly, at least, you know, you know semester wise with your, with your counselor so that you can understand where you are. Parents have to be open to hearing the critiques of counselors that they can and, and the resources that are available. If you need to use tutoring services to up your GPA, teacher in the library with the Milwaukee Public Library, we have a lot of free resources that exist um, in our community that we don't utilize. And I think those are some of the things that we can start doing to better um, engage and to help our children move forward in getting ready for college. So I think those are some of the things you can do at each of those levels. And by the time you get to you know, 10th, 11th and 12th grade, it's about the scholarship hunt. Getting that, um, you know, that essay down pat, making sure you're working with your English teacher or somebody who can help you go through that personal statement that you can tweak for those essays. Because once you write one good one, you can keep tweaking it and using it for all of those different um, scholarship applications because they all want an essay. So once you write it and have it crafted well, you can continue to use that essay for all of those scholarships and that will help you greatly. Excellent, all oh, wonderful words of encouragement, wisdom, um, valuable information that both parents and students can put into action because essentially that is what's gonna be required um, to be admitted into college and to be successful and to be a graduate on the other side. Um, this is our time. Um, if there are any additional questions, you can always reach out to me. I will give my number. It is 414-475-8761. The Milwaukee Public School Portal has a wealth of information about HBCU Week. We're celebrating all week long. Tomorrow is our call to action and we're asking all MPS staff and community members that are willing to donate to the MPS Foundation. We are going to have an inaugural HBC scholarship for one um, or two young people so that they will have the financial resources that will, will be required for them to be successful. And so I thank everyone for spending some time with me this evening. Again, do not hesitate to call. Um, and I thank you and have a good evening.